before we get started about the book, I'd like you all to take a moment's pause and think, have you ever wondered what drives money behavior? Let me share my observation with you. You know, I know of people, some of them even in their 70s and 80s, who even now keep earning money, bungalows, luxury cars, the children well settled, everything, and yet they don't like to part with money, even the smallest amount of money, you know, they like to cling on and hold on to money as much as they can. On the other hand, I have also observed people who are not even sure how they're going to get the next day's meal from. And yet they have a heart as large and, you know, they are ready to share their money with somebody or even their food with somebody who's not as rich as them. So, you know, this extreme contrast I've been observing and I always have wondered what drives money behavior. And that's exactly why I picked this book, The Psychology of Money. Now about the book, the author has given brilliant examples, great quotes, and it easily connects with the reader. You know, the moment you read it, immediately you get hooked onto it. So that's like absolutely great. So before the other two panelists uh, dissect the book, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you uh, some key takeaways from the book. I'm also going to share some of the quotes and I'm also going to share things that I think we're not so great in the book. So I'm going to like, you know, give you a complete 360 overview of my perspective of the book. So to start with, you know, what were the three things that really stood out for me from the book? You know, the author, when he starts, he gives an example of a person called Ronald James Reed. What was this person doing? He used to fix cars at a gas station. He used to sweep floors in J.C. Penney. And guess what? When he was 92 years old, which was in 2014, in the year 2014, he had a net worth of guess how much? $8 million. How was that even possible for somebody who used to be a janitor, right? And so all Reed did was he invested in blue stock chips and that helped him become from a janitor to a philanthropist. Now, in contrast to Reed, there is he talks about Richard Fuscon, who was a Harvard graduate. He worked in Merrill Lynch. He retired at 40 because he was a, one of the very successful people. And he built his dream house for which he had borrowed heavily. In 2008, he was hit by the financial crisis, which left him with high debt and illiquid assets and thereby resulted in bankruptcy. So if you were to look at both Reed and Fuscon, Reed did not go to college. He had no training, no background, no experience, nor any connections. And yet Reed had outperformed the best educated mind. How was that? Simply through investing. So the first thing, you know, the first takeaway I would say is doing well with money isn't necessarily about what you know. It's about how you behave. And behavior is really hard to teach to even the smart people. So the first thing is, my friends, what is your money behavior is something I'd like you to reflect upon. The second example the author gives, the second takeaway for us, uh, in my opinion, is he talks about a person from our country who grew up in the slums of Calcutta and went on to becoming the CEO of McKinsey. Any guesses? Well, none other than Rajat Gupta from the slums, how he rose. And then in the year 2008, he had a net worth of over 100 million. But guess what? This millionaire wanted to be a billionaire. So like we know, he was in the board of Goldman Sachs and he resorted to insider trading and his career and his reputation got irrevocably reversed, right? So. What the author says is a genius who, who loses control of their emotions can be a financial disaster. So the key takeaway is it's never enough unless you say it's enough, right? Then the third takeaway is something very interesting. What he says is when you see someone driving a nice car, you rarely think, wow, the person in the car is really cool. Instead, what the human mind tends to think is, 
I would be so cool if I were to drive that car. So normally we tend to think, you know, having an expensive car, a fancy watch, a huge house makes us feel respected and very admired. But my friends, what he says is more than those materialistic things, it's humility, kindness, and empathy, which will what will bring you more respect than any of these wealthy stuff. You know, humans, we are very tuned to judging people by wealth, by wealth, what we see. We rely on cars, the homes, the social media pictures, but yet wealth is the financial assets that haven't been converted to stuff that we actually see. So he again refers to Ronald Reed's example that he says he was nobody's financial role model because even the people who were living with him, nobody really knew of what his wealth was. So the third and the interesting point that stood out for me is wealth is not really what you see. So these were the three things that stood out for me. And apart from that, some of these quotes that, you know, one-liners that were, I found very interesting were, one is controlling your time pays the highest dividend. The author nudges people to save because he says the ability to do what you want, when you want, with whom you want for as long as you want is priceless. The second thing is, no one is impressed with your position as much as you are. The third interesting quote is, spending money to show people how much money you have is the fastest way to have less money. And the last interesting thing is, quote is, when most people say they want to be a millionaire, what they actually mean is, I'd like to spend a million bucks. And he gives an interesting example of singer Rehana. You know, Rehana almost went bankrupt because she spent all her money and she went ahead to sue her financial advisor. And the advisor responded, was it really necessary for me to tell her that if you spend the money on things, you will end up with the things and not money? So those were some important quotes that really, you know, caught my attention. And I would also like to share what I didn't greatly like about the book or things that could have been a little better. I thought the book could have been a lot more crisper because uh, at few places I thought some of the analogies were a little too long and I thought they were slightly irrelevant. And lastly, I also thought there was nothing very unique about the book because, you know, especially from an Indian context uh, where most of us are rather conservative with the money behavior, but yet, what I liked about it in contrast is to re-emphasize the known facts. You know, it's always good to get uh, drilled down with the known facts that we know. So that way I thought it made a great book. But yes, on the whole, I would really like the book and very practical stuff and, you know, relatable stuff. So that's what really, uh, what I say I liked about the book. Mm -hmm.